The topic that I'm going to speak on today is abnormal uterine bleeding. This is a very, fairly common um, problem uh, encountered in the gynecology outpatient clinic. It is something that is very distressing mentally and physically for the woman who is going through this unscheduled, heavy, prolonged, irregular kind of bleeding. And it is also sometimes challenging for the gynecologist uh, who is managing these women. Recently, clarity has emerged because of new classification of abnormal uterine bleeding by FIGO and has made it um, easier to evaluate, come to a diagnosis and also manage them more effectively. Before we go move on to the discussion on abnormal uterine bleeding, it is important for us to know what is normal menstruation. All the criteria are well defined now. The cycle length of 24 to 38 days is considered normal. Mean menstrual blood loss of uh, about 80 ml is considered uh, to be normal and acceptable. Uh, duration of bleeding is about 8 days or less. Uh, cycle um, length variation between the shortest to longest cycle uh, is seven to nine days and most women use about three to six pads a day. Before we move on to a discussion about the abnormal bleeding, we need to know what causes the bleeding and what stops the bleeding because an understanding of this physiology is important. The management especially the medical management and the choice of medications are actually based on this the first thing that happens is a destabilization of lysosomes and release of proteolytic enzymes uh, like the matric metaproteinases into the epithelial stromal and endothelial cells we must remember that it is estrogen and progesterone that uh, the the levels of which are high during the cycle and a sudden withdrawal of this progesterone is the most important event that triggers onset of menstruation. Progesterone is the hormone that actually stabilizes the lysosomes and sudden withdrawal of progesterone results in this destabilization and release of these enzymes. Once these uh, proteolytic enzymes are released into these endothelial cells and, and stromal cells. There is withdrawal of the anti-inflammatory effect causing a rise in the cytokine levels and an influx of leukocytes. There is a decrease in the tissue factor affecting extrinsic pathway of coagulation and there is a decrease in plasminogen inhibitor 1 and uh, promoting fibrinolysis. So all these together are responsible for the onset of bleeding when the levels of progesterone drops before the menstruation. Now, once the bleeding starts, it has to be arrested. And how does that happen? The arrest of bleeding normally occurs by three mechanisms. Hemostasis by platelet plug and clot formation, which is the most important event because these clots plug the mouth of these um, uh, blood vessels. They, they actually... Um, uh, stop the bleeding by going and forming a clot and sitting there and blocking these blood vessels, small uh, blood vessels in the that supply the endometrium. The prostaglandin mediated vasoconstriction is another important factor and um, uh, this prostaglandin release, the, there are vasoconstrictor and vasodilator prostaglandins. A vasoconstrictor prostaglandins are the ones which are responsible for the arrest of bleeding and uh, we will see more about it later. Tissue repair, of course, happens and this regeneration of the shed endometrium is from the mouth of the glands in the uh, um, uterine wall. Now, talking about prostaglandins, they are synthesized from phospholipids, uh, which get converted into free arachidonic acid, which then get converted into Prostaglandin E2, I2, F2 alpha, and thrombexin. Prostaglandin E2 and I2 are the vasodilator prostaglandins, and they also cause platelet anti aggregation. And F2 alpha and thrombexin A2 are the vasoconstrictors, which actually cause platelet aggregation. As you can see, the estrogen and progesterone are, have a major role to play in this 
bio, bio uh, synthetic pathway and you can see that they act at the level where the arachidonic acid is converted into these prostaglandins and the vasodilator and vasoconstrictor prostaglandins they are kept in some kind of a balance because of the levels of the estrogen progesterone. Once these levels vary, if there is a fluctuation in these levels, this fine balance between the vasodilator and the vasoconstrictor prostaglandins are again is upset and this can give rise to abnormal uterine bleeding which is what happens in the um, uh, abnormal uterine bleeding endometrial cause okay and we will discuss about it later now what is the definition of abnormal uterine bleeding it is defined as any bleeding from the genital tract that is a deviation from the normal in frequency regularity duration or quantity this can be acute or chronic an acute one is an episode of uterine bleeding in a woman of reproductive age who is not pregnant mm -hmm. and that's of sufficient quantity to require immediate intervention. Whereas chronic abnormal uterine bleeding is from the bleeding that is abnormal in frequency, regularity, duration and or volume and has been present for at least majority of the past six months. How often do we see this? It's, it occurs in about 18% of women in the reproductive age 40 to 60 percent of girls adolescent girls and about 50 percent in the perimenopausal women so as you can see it is com more common in the extremes of age like adolescence mm -hmm. and the and the perimenopausal um, age group but it is seen in about 80 to 20 percent in the reproductive age as well there are some key menstrual parameters that have been very definitely defined and we need to be aware of it because it's only based on this that we are going to arrive at whether the bleeding is abnormal or normal. So frequency of menses is, is, ref, is referred to as infrequent when it occurs more than 38 days apart and is referred to as frequent when it occurs less than 24 days apart because the normal is between 24 and 38 days. Of course, if there is no bleeding at all, it is called amenorrhea. Now, it's referred to as regular cycles when the variation between cycle lengths is 7 to 9 days and as irregular when the variation is less than 7 or more than 9 days. The duration of flow, as I said, is a normal duration is 8 days. So anything less than more than that is prolonged. More than 80 ml is considered to be heavy and less than 5 ml is considered light. Now, of course, there is also a, a definition of um, volume of blood loss as heavy, normal or light. But this definition is very, very subjective. And if the, the volume of blood loss does not interfere with the woman's physical, social or emotional quality of life, it is considered normal. But if it does, then it is considered heavy. There are certain terminologies that were used earlier, like menorrhagia, metrorrhagia, borrowed from other languages. And all these have now been uh, removed and um, the guidelines have come up with very definite terminology to describe the kind of bleeding that the person experiences. The bleeding is referred to as heavy or heavy menstrual bleeding. Cycles are regular, but prolonged <clears throat> or heavy bleeding. Let us say 10 days of bleeding but once in 30 day cycle and volume is more than 80 ml and again the volume that interferes with the physical social or emotional or material quality of life a light menstrual bleeding is less than 5 ml prolonged bleeding has been defined frequent and infrequent have been defined irregular menstruation where the variation in the length is more than 10 days intermenstrual bleeding this was to be referred to as metrorrhagia in the past and uh, now it is either called cyclic mid-cycle bleeding or cyclic premenstrual or postmenstrual bleeding and acyclical bleeding. Amenorrhea, of course, all of us know is absence of menstruation, which may be primary or secondary amenorrhea. So the terms that have been removed very definitely are menorrhagia, which is replaced by heavy menstrual bleeding and metrorrhagia, which is replaced by intermenstrual bleeding. Now, FIGO has classified abnormal uterine bleeding. This classification first came up in 2011. It has been very slightly modified in 2018. And this is a classification that I have presented here. It's very easy to remember. It is palm and coin. Palm 
of course, is polyp, adenomyosis, leomyoma, and malignancy or hyperplasia. And coin are these five things, coagulopathy or ovulatory dysfunction, endometrial causes, iatrogenic, and not otherwise cl classified. So when you make a diagnosis of abnormal uterine bleeding, now it is expected that you document what kind or what you think is the etiology. So if somebody has an abnormal uterine bleeding and you diagnose a polyp, either endometrial or cervical, you call it a AUB hyphen P. If you think it is an ovulatory dysfunction, you call it AUB hyphen O. If it is iatrogenic, you call it AUB hyphen I. And this makes it extremely clear and it makes it easier for us to decide on what is, what is a further evaluation and also what is a further management. So palm and coin it is. The palm group, polyp, adenomyosis, leomyoma and malignancy are come under this group of structural abnormalities. That is, there is some kind of an abnormality either palpable or visible on, a, on imaging in the uterus. Polyp can be endometrial or cervical and they usually present with either heavy menstrual bleeding or intermenstrual bleeding in the reproductive age group or postmenopausal bleeding in the postmenopausal age group. A cervical polyp usually occurs in the reproductive age group and presents with intermenstrual or postcoital bleeding because it is there on the cervix and contact bleeding is a very typical presentation. Adenomyosis generally occurs in perimenopausal women and they present with heavy menstrual bleeding. Leomyoma, if it is submucous and occurs in the reproductive age group, presents with heavy bleeding or intermenstrual bleeding. Postmenopausal women, of course, just presents with postmenopausal bleeding. Intramural myomas actually come with either irregular bleeding or heavy menstrual bleeding. Malignancy or hyperplasia of the endometrium postmenopausally present with bleeding as postmenopausal bleeding and perimenopausally as heavy bleeding or irregular cycles. Cervical abnormalities, either premalignant or malignant lesions, generally occur in the premenopausal age group and they present with postcoital bleeding or intermenstrual bleeding. Moving on to the coin group, the Coagulation defects and iatrogenic causes are usually not very common. Those who present with coagulation defects present in the, during the adolescence. And if they have a definite coagulation abnormality, once we make a diagnosis, they are managed by the hematologist. The iatrogenic ones are usually caused by anticoagulant therapy or medications which are similar that interfere with the um, uh, clotting of the blood and again they are managed by adjustment of the dosage or change over to some other medication we'll deal with it uh, we'll discuss that later so among the coin variety the uh, the coin classification the most uh, common conditions are ovulatory dysfunction and endometrial causes that is aubo and aube ovulatory dysfunction can present as either prolonged frequent and prolonged bleeding or as amenorrhea followed by heavy bleeding. Both these are known. The frequent and prolonged bleeding used to be referred to as threshold bleeding earlier. This term is not used anymore. The estrogen levels are low in the proliferative phase and therefore the endometrium breaks down very early. Even the ovulation itself is not interfered with but then the follicular development doesn't happen. Uh, the follicle doesn't develop fully and therefore the endometrium starts breaking down and therefore the bleeding actually begins. They, you know, they, they, these women bleed once in 18, 19, 20 days or once in 15 to 16 days and therefore it is frequent and prolonged bleeding. The bleeding can go on as spotting for almost 10 days. The other group that is used to be referred to as metropathia hemorrhagica present with amenorrhea of two or three months followed by heavy bleeding that goes on for almost 25 to 30 days. There is no ovulation. They have continued high estrogen levels which go on because unless there is ovulation, progesterone is not produced and the endometrium proliferates and proliferates and then becomes hyperplastic. And suddenly when the estrogen levels drop, there is uh, bleeding. 
Due to the lack of progesterone in this ovulatory dysfunction, the stromal support and stability are lost. The mechanisms involved in the arrest of bleeding are deficient. The endometrial levels of acidilated prostaglandins predominate and, there is, and this results in heavy menstrual flow or heavy menstrual bleeding. So what happens to the endometrium when there is unopposed estrogen action? It Usually the normal effect of estrogen on the endometrium is a proliferative change. But when the levels continue to rise or continue at a particular level, the endometrium becomes hyperplastic, but without ATP at first. Subsequently, atypical changes set in, which is referred to as hyperplasia with atypia. This used to be referred to as simple and complex earlier, but now those terminologies again have been changed. Hyper endometrial hyperplasia are now classified only as hyperplasia without atypia and hyperplasia with atypia. And ultimately, this can lead on to adenocarcinoma of the endometrium. So the ovulatory dysfunction is the most common cause of abnormal uterine bleeding occurs in the pubertal and perimenopausal women, but of course can occur, occur in the reproductive age as well. Bleeding is usually irregular, as I uh, explained earlier, can be frequent cycles with spotting or prolonged bleeding, can be infrequent cycles with prolonged and heavy bleeding, or infrequent cycles with light bleeding. Sometimes um, after periods of amenorrhea, they, they have very scanty uh, bleeding for some time. Sometimes following the amenorrhea, they have very heavy bleeding, which I described earlier. They may also have associated follicular cysts of the ovary and endometrial hyperplasia. Following are the characteristics of cystic hyperplasia, meaning the glands are hyperplastic and so is the stroma. The cystic or irregularly dilated glands, as you can see in the picture that I have given, there is increase in the vascularization. Thick wall tortures, dilated spiral arterioles and veins are seen. There's infarction and thrombosis of blood vessels and necrosis of superficial endometrium. And this appearance used to be referred to as Swiss cheese appearance earlier. And even now, I think it's still called Swiss cheese appearance. Now, the endometrial causes of AUB, that is AUBE in the coin group, they present with cyclical bleeding, but heavy menstrual bleeding. The uterus is usually normal in size. And... The basic pathology is an alteration in the ratio of PGE to PGF2 alpha. That is the ratio of vasodilator to vasoconstrictor prostaglandins. And um, there is also, in addition, an increase in the fibrinolytic activity here. Now, having made the diagnosis of an abnormal uterine bleeding, I mean, or to make the diagnosis of an abnormal uterine bleeding, I'm sorry, how uh, do we proceed? We start with history as is usual with any patient. You need to look at the age of the patient. Is she premenopausal? Is she, um, young? Is she a young girl? What's the age at menarche? How, is she multiparous? Because par uh, you, you know that multiparous women are more prone to adenomyosis, whereas those who are either naliparous or of low parity could have endometriosis or fibroids. Duration of abnormal uterine bleeding is important. Whether it is acute or chronic is important because the management differs. We need to define the key menstrual parameters and you need to look at the type of bleeding. Is it heavy menstrual bleeding? Is it intermenstrual bleeding? Is it cyclical bleeding? Of course, we need to know whether there's dysmenorrhea because it could actually uh, be endometriosis, sometimes fibroid, sometimes adenomyosis. Was there a recent pregnancy, miscarriage or an IUCD insertion? Um, we, any of these could be a cause of the bleeding. Was there a rec recent weight gain or loss? This weight gain is a very, very important um, factor, especially in the perimenopause, in the uh, peripubertal uh, young girls and even in the reproductive age because there is a peripheral secretion or conversion of androstenedione dion to estrogen in the peripheral fatty tissue. And this estrogen can interfere with the cyclical function of the pituitary um, chondrotropins and the, and the uh, estrogen and progesterone that are produced by the ovary uh, can lead to prolonged period of amenorrhea because of the continued estrogen level uh, and this amenorrhea could be followed by either heavy bleeding or could be followed by scanty bleeding that goes on for a long time. Basically, they, got, they cause ovulatory dysfunction that is very commonly associated with 
obesity, or even a sudden weight gain of about 5 kilos. Systemic illness, of course, should be looked into hepatic, renal, or other systemic illnesses. Physical examination consists of general examination to look for pallor, thyroid enlargement. BMI is extremely important. As I told you, obesity and abnormal uterine bleeding go together. Look for ecchymosis and purpura to know whether she could have an underlying bleeding disorder. Signs of polycystic ovarian syndrome like hirsutism, acanthosis, nigricum, acne should be looked at. Speculum examination is mandatory. Look at the cervix and vagina to see whether there is any polyp growth. By manual examination for the size and contour of the uterus, it could be a fibroid, it could be an adenomyosis, tenderness, fixity of the uterus, adnexal mass tenderness or induration. After history and clinical examination, we need to decide on what investigations need to be done in, a, in an individual patient. They vary with the age and symptoms and uh, your findings on clinical examination. The usual lab test done in all women with abnormal uterine bleeding are hemoglobin and a complete blood count because you want to know how much bleeding has actually been there, how much blood has she lost. The thyroid function test or a TSH is required only if hypothyroidism is, sus thyroidism is suspected because of a thyroid uh, enlargement which is clinically diagnosed. A prothrombin time or a partial thromboplastin time are required in young girls where coagulation disorders are suspected. And how do we suspect these? Basically based on history of bleeding in childhood, uh, history of bleeding whenever there has been a minor trauma, family history of uh, bleeding disorders, etc. And on examination, any purpura or ecchymotic spots. A cervical cytology is mandatory in all except the adolescent girls. Do we do an ultrasonography in all these women? Again, I think a decision should be based on the age, the symptoms, our suspected structural abnormality. If on clinical examination you find that uterus is irregular and you suspect uh, myoma, yes, go ahead. If you have a patient whom you have thought the uterus was normal in size, treated with hormones, but the bleeding continues to have, it keeps recurring and it could be an endometrial polyp. This is not made out on a clinical examination. So may you want to exclude that and therefore you may need an ultrasound scan. So this depends basically on the age, the symptoms and your clinical diagnosis. Do we need to do an endometrial sampling in all? According to the Federation of Obstetrics and Gynecological Societies of India and good clinical practice recommendations, endometrial biopsy is recommended in women over 40 years because these are the women who are more prone to endometrial hyperplasia or carcinoma, especially when it is associated with frequent heavy or prolonged bleeding. <clears throat> in women of reproductive age where there is persistent abnormal uterine bleeding associated with risk factors for endometrial hyperplasia like obesity, PCOS, tamoxifen therapy, uh, thick endometrium or family history of hereditary ovarian or in, in breast or endometrial cancers. Now, women with postmenopausal bleeding, if the endometrial thickness is more than 4 millimeters, is indicative of estrogen action and therefore definitely an endometrial biopsy or sampling is required. Hysteroscopy, do we do in all? No. When there is suspected polyp or when you suspect a submucous myoma on ultrasonography. This is a pipel that is used for endometrial sampling. Gone are the days when we use the metal endometrial curette. Uh, this is a very thin plastic cannula. You can introduce it into the endometrium even without dilating the cervix and you can use it in postmenopausal women as well because even in that with the, in the narrow cervix this can be negotiated and so this is what is used now for endometrial sampling. Now having taken a good history, performed a clinical examination, performed either an ultrasonography or a pipel or endometrial sampling and got a diagnosis, we need to now decide on the management. How do we manage abnormal uterine bleeding? As we already said, they could present with acute bleeding or they could come with chronic abnormal uterine bleeding. If she comes with acute bleeding, 
which is more common in adolescents, we certainly need to exclude coagulation disorders. You might ask for those tests, but you will look at whether she is hemodynamically stable or not. If she is hemodynamically unstable, which some of them are, these girls can present with a hemoglobin of 3 grams, 4 grams, profuse bleeding, almost in shock. So if she is hemodynamically unstable, you need to transfuse. You could do a uterine balloon tamponade to stop the bleeding or you could even do a curettage to remove the shed endometrium, remove the functional layer which is kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, sloughed off and uh, uh, the bleeding generally stops. But very rarely that we have to resort to those these methods of treatment now because medications are available. If the girl is hemodynamically stable or you have stabilized her with blood transfusion, you need to decide on what your management is going to be. If the hemoglobin is less than 7 grams and she comes with a chronic AUB, you, she, you need to transfuse her. You must remember before starting treatment that in acute bleeding, the functional layer is lost and therefore estrogen priming is essential before progesterone can act on the endometrium. It is a progesterone that's going to actually um, help the, uh, uh, the endometrium grow and help, the, help you stop the bleeding, but you have to prime with the estrogen before you can administer progesterone. Most people talk about an inject, uh, injection of conjugated equine estrogen, 25 milligram IV uh, and reduced tapered off to Q, uh, six hour early. But remember, this is not available in India. Therefore, we usually use oral conjugated estrogen 2.5 milligram four times daily, tapered off slowly and add progesterone 48 hours later. Or we can use a combination pill. Here there is estrogen and that will prime the endometrium and the progesterone will slowly start working. So a uh, combined oral contraceptive pill can be started off given six hourly and then reduced to eight hourly and slowly tapered off to once daily. Or you could use progesterone alone, proluton depot, and then continue it with abnorethisterone, but this doesn't work very well unless you give progesterone, uh, unless you give estrogen to prime the endometrium. Injection tranexamic acid, 10 milligram per kilogram, 8th hourly, followed by oral, 1 gram thrice daily for 5 days, is a very, very commonly used and effective treatment now for any kind of bleeding from the uterus, be it um, bleeding associated with, uh, you, know, you know, following delivery, a postpartum hemorrhage or acute uh, abnormal uterine bleeding in, a, in an adolescent. Very effective in stopping the bleeding, but <clears throat> you will have to switch to hormones or add hormones along with this for um, regularization of cycles and continuation of therapy. Now, the, in a woman with chronic abnormal uterine bleeding, the general measures are treatment of anemia, do not forget this, oral iron therapy or even back cell transfusion. In Girls or women who are obese, lifestyle modification is very important, which is by diet and exercises. It's basically weight optimization that is required. In women who have structural abnormalities, that is the palm, polypadinomyosis, myoma or malignancy, the management is quite different. Once you've made a diagnosis of any one of this, if it's a polyp, you evaluate and remove it hysteroscopically. If it's adenomyosis, use analgesics, oral contraceptive pills, combined oral contraceptive pills, levonorgestrel in dry drain system or hysterectomy. If it's a myoma, medical or surgical management. If it's a malignancy or pre-malignant condition, you need to manage accordingly. If it's AUB due to coagulopathy, you could try tranexamic acid or combined oral contraceptive pills. Levonorgestrel in dry drain system is a very good option. If none of these work, you could use desmopressin. Endometrial ablation is, of course, one of the options in those who have completed family. Moving on to medical management of AUBO and AUBE, which are, as I told you, the common ones that we come across 
earlier referred to as anovulatory bleeding and ovulatory bleeding. Uh, dysfunction uterine bleeding was a term that was used to describe these. We have hormonal and non-hormonal therapies. The hormonal therapy consists of either a combination of estrogen and progesterone or progesterone estrogen used alone. Non-hormonal therapy consists of either antifibrinolytics, PG synthetase inhibitors, GNR analogs and antagonists, selective estrogen and selective progesterone receptor modulators. Now, estrogen progesterone combinations or progestin alones are the ones which are most often used. Estrogen alone is seldom used. The progestin use can be oral, intramuscular or intrauterine. The combination of estrogen and progestin actually is a first line treatment in AUBO and endometrial hyperplasia. They can be used in bleeding due to leomyoma, adenomyosis and even coagulopathies. They usually contain ethanyl estradiol of 20 to 30 micrograms of progesterone of 0.15 to 0.3 milligram. They reduce the blood loss by 70%. They of course reduce dysmenorrhea as well and regularize menstrual cycles. You can use them as 21 day pill or extended cycle pill. Extended cycle pills are very useful. You give them the medication for 80 days and 84 days basically and give them a four packets and give them a break of one week. And of course, you restart after that. And these extended cycle pills, uh, they are, uh, the patient acceptance is very good and they actually uh, work very well. The duration of treatment may be three or six months. Progesterone, so oral progesterone we use are medroxyprogesterone acetate, norethisterone or norethindrone. You can give it for 10 days every month. Say somebody who is in the perimenopausal age group and has got uh, bleeding once in 50 days, once in 60 days, very irregular. And uh, when it does happen, it's a little heavy. You could give them progesterone for 10 days every month, for the first to 10th of every month and they get very regular withdrawal bleeding. They have enough endogenous estrogen to keep them going. And when this withdrawal bleeding stops, you can actually uh, check them to uh, check the FSH levels to see whether they are menopausal and then change on to hormone replacement or menopausal hormone therapy. You can also use it for 20 days every month if you are using it for controlling the bleeding. Somebody who comes with chronic abnormal uh, uterine bleeding, you can uh, start them on this on day 5 of the cycle and continue till day 25. Injectable progesterones are used quite commonly. They are useful they, as, or, as um, uh, long acting contraceptions, but uh, they are also used for uh, control of abnormal uterine bleeding. Levonorgestrel intrauterine system is the one that has really made a very big difference in the management of abnormal uterine bleeding of, of any etiology. They are effective in AUBE, AUBO, AUB due to adenomyosis and even AUB due to leomyoma, especially if the myomas are small. They can also be used in endometrial hyperplasia. Usually here, those with 52 milligram of progesterone is preferred because they release about 20 microgram of progesterone per day acts directly on it's a, on the endometrium the progesterone is is there acting on the endometrium in the uterine cavity there's no variant suppression they reduce blood loss by 95 percent and cause amenorrhea as well before you insert it you need to counsel the woman and tell her that this amenorrhea is quite acceptable. Once this is removed, she will start having regular menstrual bleeding. Efficacy is comparable to endometrial ablation. This has basically revolutionized the treatment of abnormal uterine bleeding. We have antifibrinolytics. As you know that the AU, AUBE is caused by a balance an imbalance between the vasodilator and vasoconstrictor prostaglandins and also increase in the fib uh, fibrinolytic activity and therefore antifibrinolytics help here. The preparation used is tranexamic acid, one gram thrice daily for three to five days. Blood loss is reduced by 50% and they are more effective than PG synthesis inhibitors and they are the choice of drug in the treatment of AUBE can also be used in other kinds of uh, abnormal uterine bleeding. We have the PG synthetase inhibitors, mephenemic acid, naproxen and ibuprofen. They relieve dysmenorrhea and reduce blood loss. They do have mild gastrointestinal side effects. 
the dosages vary depending on the drug used and these are also used for three to five days what you to be, need to be remembered is that these pg synthetase inhibitors especially mefenemic acid in combination with antifibrinolytic that is the tranexamic acid work very well two of them put together reduce the bleeding quite considerably and also relieve dysmenorrhea and they are the drugs of choice in the management of AUBE. We, all, we did mention GNRH analogs and antagonists. They are used for temporary relief of symptoms and they are more useful in endometriosis or management of myoma to shrink the size etc. Selective estrogen receptor modulators are being used often now or meloxifen is what is used twice weekly for 12 weeks, a significant reduction in bleeding and can be used when the combined oral, uh, oral contraceptive pills or progesterones do not work. Selective progesterone receptor modulator are usually used in leomyoma. Moving on to surgical management, if, you're, if you find that you have tried the contraceptive pills and liver nodule intrauterine system and the patient continues to bleed, this does happen. It's not as if all women who present with AUBE and AUBO actually respond to all this. You might have about 5% of women who do not respond to the medications and you might have to resort to some kind of surgery. You could, it, the surgery could be conservative in the form of an endometrial ablation or hysterectomy if the woman is in the perimenopausal age group. Endometrial ablation techniques available are broadly classified into first generation and second generation techniques. The first generation techniques use a resectoscope and the second generation techniques use are non-resectoscopic techniques. Of these, the hot liquid balloon ablation, microwave ablation have all been, and hydrothermal uh, ablation are all, they used to be very popular. The indications and contraindications basically, uh, the indications are when uh, in women with AUBE or O where medical therapy has failed, which I already mentioned. Young women who with the desire to preserve the uterus and poor surgical risk for hysterectomy. The contraindications are desire for fertility. If you have destroyed the endometrium, fertility can be an issue, large uteri, endometrial hyperplasia, suspected malignancy. Obviously, you're not going to be uh, managing them uh, with, by destruction of the endometrium. Multiple la or large myomas, postmenopausal women, and prior classical section or myomectomy. This is the equipment used for thermal balloon ablation. But please remember that with the advent of liver nodule intrauterine system, all these endometrial ablation techniques, even the second generation techniques, have taken a back seat because they do have complications like uterine perforation, hemorrhage, intrauterine scarring, myoma, infection. Whereas liver nodule intrauterine system is very safe and is very effective and that has basically replaced endometrial ablation almost completely. Of course, there are some women who do not respond to your therapy who are say 48, 49 and tell you, I don't want to go on with this any longer. Please get, just remove my uterus. And these are the women in whom you might want to do a hysterectomy. Otherwise, hysterectomy for abnormal uterine bleeding is something that, uh, especially with liver nodule intrauterine system being available, something that we do not perform at all. Indications are complex atypical hyperplasia in the older women, failed medical therapy in perimenopausal women, failed endometrial ablation and other pelvic pathology that needs concomitant uh, surgery. To summarize, the management of AUB in the adolescence, you start with clinical uh, evaluation, do a hemoglobin. Uh, if you suspect bleeding disorder, you do a coagulation workup. If you suspect thyroid dysfunction, perform thyroid function test and treat either of the, whatever is the cause that you identified. If it is just an AUBO, that is ovulatory dysfunction, she comes with an acute and severe bleed, you admit transfuse and start on either combined oral contraceptive pills or ethanyl estradiol um, followed by progesterone. If she has come with mild bleeding, counsel her and ask her to maintain a menstrual calendar. If she's come with 
moderate bleeding, oral ion therapy and perhaps cyclic OC pills or progestins is what is indicated. Management of abnormal uterine bleeding in the reproductive age group, I have tried to summarize it here. It's a very, very difficult slide to uh, read, but if you can, you classify them as bleeding due to structural abnormalities, that, that is the palm or the other causes, that is a coin. And depending on that, if it is a structural abnormality, you Evaluate them with an ultrasonography and endometrial sampling whenever required and treat polyps, adenomyosis, leomyoma and hyperplasia the way they all have to be treated. If they have one of these causes, the coin classification, the, do a perform a coagulation workup and review the medications to see whether it's a nitrogenic cause. Evaluate for polycystic ovarian syndrome. Most of them be, belong to the EBO or E category. If it is coagulation disorders, manage accordingly. You could give them tranexamic acid, combine oral contraceptive pills or desmopressin. Ovulatory dysfunction is what we discussed in detail. Treat them with, again, combine oral contraceptives, progestins or liver nodule in system. If it's endometrial cause, you treat with either tranexamic acid or methanibic acid or a combination or liver nodule in system. Hydrogenic, of course, adjust the medication or change the medication, not otherwise classified, you have to basically exclude liver disease, renal disease and thyroid dysfunction, manage accordingly. Thank you very much for your attention and I hope you benefited from the lecture. Thank you.